I'm drowning in your political water, the time lapse of a prodigal daughter. My need to return to the land is divided between white and black minds where their love suicided. I'm crushed by the labels Indigenous and Abo, needs pushed aside with economic bravado, in hands of men trained in competent law. Compassion and justice are often ignored. But listen now to the still quiet cry of a land and her people dissolved in a lie. No one shall remember just who or why sent. Just tell them the government grants have been spent. But take heed all you then with the power in your hand to turn or to hold the rights of this land. Remember it's not yours or mine that we're speaking. Just realise it's love of this land that we're seeking a right to return and nurture the old as a keepsake for generations yet to unfold. Uh, when people say a stolen generation member, I don't like that term because that denotes a membership that I never subscribe to. My name's Mandy Brown. I'm a Naranjiri Piramunk woman living on Piramunk country. For a long time I called myself a victim, as, as some people do. But now I say I'm a survivor of the Stolen Generations. When I was born in the end of November 1960, uh, I was with my mother for six weeks. And then I was removed at six weeks and taken to a white British family that had come out on the 10 pound boats out in Elizabeth. I was brought up by the British migrant family uh, as the first Aboriginal child they had in their care. So they already had two children of their own in England and then had adopted a white boy in England as well. And then they came out here and they put him for adoption for a girl and so they got me. They didn't know anything about Aboriginal children so that was a steep learning curve for them. When the Bring Them Home report uh, you know, was commissioned and I went to give a submission to the Bringing Them Home report, it was very hard for me to articulate uh, what, what I hadn't known and then had come to know through this commission. So you wanted it to be factual, but you also wanted it to, to explain emotionally how you felt. So I, I couldn't really talk to the commissioner. I, had, I wrote two poems and handed that in as my submission. And one talking about the fathers as well, because everyone was talking about the mothers and removal, and no one was talking about the men and how they felt about the children being removed. We weren't even labelled as Stolen Generations then. It was just the commission and we all had to tell our stories and it was, you know, um, try, trying to find out what had happened. And I think the biggest shock for me was that this was something that was not illegal, that it was quite legal under the assimilation policy to remove children. I hadn't found my mother then. I didn't know really any, hardly any um, family members because as a stolen generation person, you don't have access to the Aboriginal community as such. Um, they come looking for you or you happen upon other Aboriginal people. There weren't the events that, that are around now. There was a sort of link up that the old aunties had done here in Adelaide that I had joined up and would go down to of a Thursday evening, I think, once a month, and try to find people. And, and it took time, it took a long time to, you know, you'd find one person and then that took a lot of emotional upheaval and then you'd have to find another person or they'd link you into someone else. All these things were all over the place. It was, you know, a really messy jigsaw puzzle to try to piece together that I'm still piecing together. Mm. And a jigsaw puzzle will always have delineation, so there'll be lines on it that will never really smoothly connect. And I think that's, that's you know, with any person that's been removed, that will happen, that there'll never be that real sense of full connection. Yeah, the poetry's been really cathartic. I think that's stabilised me in a lot of ways. Like, I'm a pretty articulate person, but not when it comes down to stuff like this, how do you articulate all these emotions and funnel them down? And that's the gift that I have is to be able to succinctly say what I need to say in words because I'm really limited by the alphabet on emotion. I think anybody is. Some of the poetry was a little bit angry at first and now it's a lot more mellow 
as I heal more and go along my journey. You make a choice. You have to make choices every day. And my choice were, well, I can, I can sink or swim here. And I can be angry and bitter about things, but at the end of the day, I really just, you know, want to be at peace and happy and my family, my children and grandchildren. So you have to make that choice to do that. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy to find the strength some days and other days, you know, like today, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Some people will say to me, well, a lot of things happen to other cultures and other people around the world, and that's true, you know. Um, but this is where I see it and, and this is how I relate because it is different, you know, it is different. We're on our own land, removed from our own land. It affects all Aboriginal people that, you know, it's not just about the stolen children, it's about the stolen land as well. To me, personally, the apology was um, huge. To hear the head of state stand up and the first port of call in parliament was to apologise. Yes, that was, I mean, it's immensely gratifying and healing to hear someone say sorry. With ongoing child removal of, especially First Nations children being the high demographic of removal. You know, the removals are happening, whatever organisation is allocating these removals really needs to work together with other organisations and Aboriginal people to look further up the creek and see what happened back there and stop that flow. Look way back in history and talk to people who that history has affected and try to get some action happening around that. Of course, we don't have the assimilation policy now, the White Australia policy, but that doesn't stop practices happening. You know, I look after my great-grandson, so he was removed at three months, and it took a long time for us to get him back. So he had nine placements in nine months. Fighting the system was, I think, one of the hardest things I've had to do, and I was, you know, a professional working in the field, quite able to take the child. I've had him now for five years. Uh, so that's, you know, to me, I, I know exactly what, you know, when they won't let the child come back. It's one thing for removal and the reasons around removal. The rest of the family can't have him. It's an ongoing healing process. It's a, a time of reflection and a time to educate. And just hoping that, you know, that we'll be able to, you know, use the term move forward. Moving forward, you're moving, but you're moving with a lot of baggage. And that's the hardest thing. And, and moving through mud and quicksand. It's not easy. So the moving is very slow. And, you know, I've always said I don't expect to see a lot of great change in my lifetime, but I do hope for that for my grandchildren. I can't change Dad's history, but, but what I can do is, is live my life in a particular way that pays respect to the way that he taught me and the things he taught me and um, and I can impart that on my two kids as well. My name's Joshua Trevorrow, uh, I'm 37 years old. My father was Malcolm Trevorrow. I descend from the Rumanjeri people of the Nutanjeri Nation. So I'd like to start by acknowledging my ancestors, the traditional custodians of this land that I'm meeting on today. Um, I pay my respects to, to my elders, past and present, and acknowledge their deep and spiritual connection with the, the lands and waters of this region. And I also pay my respects to, to all First Nations around the country. We're meeting today at Rattalung, also known as Basham's Beach near Port Elliot. This is a, a significant site for um, Nutanjeri people. It, it forms a significant part of the, of the Nutanjeri creation story, the Nurundari story, and it's a really important place for me. I feel a lot of spiritual connectivity to this site. I've spent some time here with Uncle Mark Kumatri, who's become a very important Nutanjeri elder to me and a leader. So I often come here to just to clear my head. If I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed or stressed, I often just come here, sit down on the rocks and, and look out at the water and just feel, feel the, feel the connection and the spirituality of, the, of such an important site. Dad was born on the 20th of April, 1943. He was removed within the first six months of his life. He had four, four siblings and they were all removed and taken into to state care. 
I think Dad, in a lot of ways, was was very fortunate because he grew up in and out of foster care with a, with a lady by the name of Dorothy Gribble, and she was an incredibly caring and beautiful person. There's a lot of documentation between Dorothy and the department trying to get Dad back to her house and you know live with her and her husband uh, permanently. He just wanted love. He was he was struggling. He was you know he was running away from from the homes and trying to get back to. To, yeah, Mrs. Gribble. So it's quite incredible now that you know I can I can still read and understand and learn, um, you know, Dad's journey, even though he's not here to to tell me about it anymore. Dad passed away when I just turned 17, and I guess I was just getting to that age as a young man. We were starting to connect, and I was starting to to you know really understand um, him as a person, and, and vice versa but he was always an incredible role model for me. He spent 29 years in the, in the Metropolitan Fire Service and instilled a lot of, you know, a lot of values in me that I, that I still hold today and that I, that, you know, I pass on to, to my children and that's, um, that's work ethic, um, passion and, and strength. Dad personally never really spoke to me or mum about his journey as a child. I believe it would have been very traumatic for him. I found all of his documentation, so it was obviously something that he, you know, he, he, he went on a journey and he, he sought out um, to, to learn more, you know, and to, to document that. And I'm so glad he did, because I have it now. I know being removed, um, you know, changed his, his path. It affected him as a person. Thankfully, he used that, that experience and that trauma to, to um, you know, shape who he was and, and make him make him stronger um, because he never gave up he absolutely never gave up for me now it's about my children my two girls Matilda and Florence understanding um, you know the history that we have in this country and what what happened to to so many people that history never never goes away so we're now functioning in a in a predominantly non-aboriginal society but we walk around carrying carrying this history, you know, and that, that, never, that never goes away. That's always going to be there for, for Aboriginal people. And we spend a lot of time in a society that doesn't understand and that, that doesn't listen. And, and, um, and that can be extremely difficult for people. You know, something I'm really passionate about is, is our curriculum system. I grew up attending very mainstream schools. And unfortunately, you know, Australian history um, pre-colonisation just isn't, wasn't, you know, wasn't taught. So I actually grew up with, with quite fair skin, able to hide my Aboriginality and I was almost, you know, I was almost not expected, but I, was, I felt a pressure to, to do that in a, in a mainstream institution that didn't, that didn't harbour or support, you know, Aboriginal people. So for me, I had to, I had to self-educate myself and Unfortunately, in Australia, that's that's a, that's part of the huge problem we face is that people don't understand. They're not they're not forced to go on a, on a journey of this discovery where they where they have to, to learn and understand these things. It's important that you know we understand our history beyond the last few hundred years. You know, this is 60,000 plus years of, of history, and 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 also how the how colonisation affected Aboriginal people and, and still does today. Aboriginal people have been been telling their truth for for many years, and I think now, uh, as a society, it, it's about truth listening. So it's what it's what we do with that truth now, what we do with that information, and we all need to to move forward together. Um, I personally believe that we, you know, we live on the most beautiful continent on the planet. It's important for us to all work together to to look after the most important thing in all our lives and that, that's our planet. This is the role of elders. It, it is to embrace people, to bring them back into the fold and say, you actually belong. Hi, I'm Mark Kumatri. I'm a Nutanjali elder. I own a company called Cool Tours that delivers authentic Aboriginal experiences through the Fleurio Peninsula. I am the youngest of my family and so all of my other siblings 
they were living either on Rakan itself under the mission control or they were living in the fringe dwellings outside of Meningi. When I was born, we were then living in the town. Prior to that, our people weren't allowed in town after six o'clock at night. So I don't know whether or not I was the lucky one to be able to living in the town when I was born in 64, or whether or not I was the unlucky one who didn't get brought up on country. Growing up with my family, my older brothers and sisters, growing up with a mum and dad that were very, that they'd had it really tough. They'd grown up in eras of the early 1920s, whereby our people were just getting used to, to living on a mission. So we'd been on the mission for about 70 years up to that period. My parents, their parents or my grandparents were just totally removed from country. And they, they were just gathered up and herded like cattle or sheep and, and put on these missions. My parents come through that era and so they were able to teach us about resilience and being taught about how to be strong and, and know who you are and your identity. However, living through an era where we weren't allowed to have an identity. Port Maclay Aboriginal Mission was set up in the 1850s and it took most of the Nurundjeri people and we're all placed or displaced off country and all put onto one place, being known as the Point Maclay Aboriginal Mission. It was a time where there were superintendents there who had total control over our people to take away our language, take away our, our identity, take everything away from us and turn us into something that was supposed to be more, let's call it Australian. Now in 1974, we then become known as Rakan. Rakan is a word that means meeting place. And under that banner, it meant we as a community had control of our destiny. That land is still owned by the government. And what goes on, the government still owning that land means that even though we were displaced and put onto one place to make it our home, we're asking government to give back us Raukin, full control, don't have any ownership. You took everything else away from us. Now it is time to give us just that one piece of land that you forced us to be on. It's as simple as that, give it back. With my discussions with Josh, Josh has been trying to find his place and being totally removed, it is meant for people like Josh that he's got to try and find his place and he's got to be accepted in to have his place. For Josh, he has struggled through that. He has struggled about who is he? What is his place? Where does he fit into Nurundjeri? And so what he's had to do is to reach out. And he's reached out to people like me to be able to embrace him, to come with open arms and say, Josh, come and join us. I will tell you who your family is. So he now knows where does he belong within the Nurundjeri nation. And for someone who's been reaching out to be able to do that, it's actually comforting for him. And he's, he's expressed that to me of saying, you know, thank you, uncle, I didn't know. Anybody could get a piece of paper. You can go through the Western system and get a piece of paper and that's available for anybody. But not everyone can be a person of knowledge. And as a Munkambole, that's been brought down to me. And so I've been very lucky to be able to grow up in a world where I'm a part of the Western world. However, I've been able to learn the ways of the old people. And that's been taught to me by my parents, been taught to me by my older siblings. It's been taught to me by my uncles and aunties. My, my grandmother, when I was a little fella, I sat down with her every single day having lunch with her. So it's all of those sort of things that, that, that learning has been a lifelong journey for me. And, and it is about that. And then it is about giving back to other people 
so that we empower them. We empower them in a world of knowledge about their identity and how they can have that, that feeling in something that we call our miwi, something that is deep within, almost like a gut feeling, but it's far stronger. It's a feeling of knowing who you are and it, it, it's, it is the guiding principle for us. And that's what we need to strengthen people's miwi. Truth telling has to happen of this is what really occurred. This is what we need to do about it. All of the cultural teaching I do is about oneness. It's about saying we all belong to one race, that being the human race. We're, we're willing to come halfway. We're probably coming three quarters of the way. We just need other people to, to embrace what we're saying. Why country is important to us. Why language is important. Why identity is important. On the apology day, I was actually working in a drug and alcohol rehab. You can imagine that these people were living through historical trauma and, and the effects of that was the drugs and alcohol. Now, with the stolen generation, it's the same thing. There's that yearning, that, that one for healing. It's the same sorts of things. So the day of the apology, I'll always remember it because people were going through a healing process and I could understand the work I was doing in a drug and alcohol rehab and aligning it with the healing that the people from the stolen generation were needing. I just want to share this very important storyline of this stick that tells the story of our family. In days gone by, our family lived in harmony with the land, the waters, and the cosmology. Then at a time in life, things started to change for us. Settlement of where we are at the moment in South Australia and more and more people started to come abroad. We were removed from country, removed from identity, removed from all culture. And even though our stories were deep rooted in the country, we lost a lot of branches. As time went on, our worlds got darker and darker and darker and we were trying to keep a grip on who we are but our hands kept on slipping after a period of time our tree became smaller and smaller our identity was less and less who we are our songs our stories our culture was less and less valued by those who come. Life continued on that way with us being caught up in a world that no longer belonged to us. Yet, it was a part of who we are. Time went on and where we are today, we've started to come out of this century with a brightness, a way forward to where we are right now. Where my children, my grandchildren are there to be part of a new future. The sun is bright, life is good. But we have a way forward. But what we can never do is forget about this. We must acknowledge everyone as Australians about this. We must honour that we've been able to come through it and we must do something about the future. We believe in oneness, but oneness is going to take all of this and much more.
train. Apologise for the hurt, the pain and suffering we the Parliament have caused you by the laws that previous Parliaments have enacted. We apologise for the indignity, the degradation and the humiliation these laws embody. We offer this apology to the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, the families and the communities whose lives were ripped apart by the actions of successive governments under successive Parliaments. So let us turn this page together. Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, government and opposition, Commonwealth and state, and write this new chapter in our nation's story together. 
And my sisters, titters, Dan Salt and Kev Comedy Paving the way for me and many The stand up tall, young black and deadly, I'm proud I'm a proud Aboriginal man That's why I got that flag tattooed on my hand Cause we're the oldest in civilization Yet we're the coldest in a hypocritical nation I get asked about three times a week If I'm Aboriginal, but see Don't matter what the colour of your skin Where you've been, brother Written in my blood, black history, brother And I can feel it, man, the energy, the synergy You mimic me, deep down the truth is you're sick of me Napalina, Kuparuna, Niara I'm from a Tulumponga, Lara Pune Yeah, Luchuwita Love for Larakia and MT Nungas West, Kuris, Murrays All that love for all the Ghana mob in SA cause, cause, cause. A black swan, black swan, stand up tall when you're singing, cause you're singing for me, my man. A black swan, black swan, stand up tall when you're singing, cause you're singing for me, my man. For me, my man. Back to the people. Now, Tilly, why did you choose to tell this story? At Christie's Beach, we respect the land we learn on is the Ghana land, and we acknowledge this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Our culture group has been learning about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, culture and communities. As a part of this learning, we discuss the soul in generations. We thought it was only right to use Wakakiri as an opportunity to share our learning around these experiences. We wanted to show the impact the stolen duration had and continues to have on the identity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, especially the generational identity impacts such as loss of language, knowledge, culture. It's important we encourage reconciliation and knowledge past wrongdoings in order to move forwards. Excellent, great stuff. And uh, you definitely succeeded. Now, Lucas, how did you make sure that it was a sustainable little project? It was important that we told our story, but also kept the cost and environmental impact low. The props we used in our performance were all recycled. We have used a combination of voting boxes and boxes from school deliveries. We have also utilised old props from our previous performing arts performances. Most of our costumes were purchased from op shops provided by students or found already in the drama room and will be stored to be reused for future performances. Great stuff. And you all get a cool T-shirt as well. Yeah. And Chloe, who would you like to thank? We would like to thank all the students who participated in such an important event and worked so hard over the past few terms. We would like to thank our teachers and Miss O'Day for being flexible and supporting our involvement in Wakakiri. Thank you to our parents for supporting us with attending rehearsals and workshops over the school holidays and student free days. We would also like to thank them for helping us find and purchase costumes to make tonight possible. A big special thanks to our teachers, Tamir and Miss Crockford, for working with us and supporting us over the past few terms. 
Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you to all the families who lent us their precious Coolamons. We are so grateful. We hope you enjoyed our performance, that we have given you something that you can now use to share these experiences and history with families, peers and schools.